All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC308. Thank you for joining the class today. Uh, let's pray and get started. Somebody could lead us in prayer, please, and then we'll start. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you under the name of Jesus. I thank you for this day. Thank you for the class we are about to have, God. God, we thank you for being a God who speaks. And uh, uh, you have spoken to us about uh, the later days. And so that, God, we could prepare ourselves. We could uh, uh, preach the gospel much more boldly. We can understand the need behind it. But I pray that as we learn about... Uh, the end times and uh, the revelation that Daniel God, God, I pray that you will help us to understand uh, the things as Pastor Ashes teaches, uh, the deeper truths in the Bible, help us to open our mind and heart and listen to it and be fully convinced in the truth so that we can shine for your kingdom. Uh, help, give us a good Wi-Fi connection throughout the session. I bless all my classmates. We thank you for Pastor Ashish. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Um, today, our plan is to start uh, our study through the book of Revelation. Uh, but before we go into um, the book of Revelation, any questions on Daniel? The chapters that we have seen, any questions that have come to your mind? You're welcome to ask. Or we'll just go ahead and start with Revelation. All right, let's just get started with the book of Revelation. And of course, anytime, anytime you have questions on Daniel or Revelation or any other things we're talking, you're welcome to ask. So uh, I have um, put out the lecture notes for what we're going to be doing in Revelation, plus uh, I've also shared two book, two PDF books, uh, John, one by John Woolward and the other one by Jack Van Impe. Uh, both these uh, both these people are scholars, uh, people of this, uh, you know, done a lot of work uh, in uh, studying Revelation. Daniel, I mean, Jack Van Impe has um, the late Dr. Jack Van. I mean, he's passed on to be with the Lord, but. He, during his ministry, spent, uh, I think, almost 60 years, if I'm not mistaken, uh, on teaching on the end times. So it means it is a lifetime, Jack Van Impe, Dr. Jack Van Impe, uh, spent a lifetime uh, of ministry focused on the end times, Bible prophecy. So. Uh, he has been uh, a well, you know, well-known authority uh, on 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 these topics. So, you know, if you have time, again, these are uh, you know detailed books. So, if you have time, you you're welcome to read it. But hopefully, uh, as we go through uh, verse by verse through Revelation, uh, we will uh, learn learn uh, a lot of things. So, let me uh, let's just begin by. Um, giving an introduction right, to the book of Revelation. So we know that uh, the Apostle John, uh, who was the uh, the last living apostle of, of the Twelve, um, uh, it, he was quite elderly, so maybe 80 plus years, and uh, he had been uh, banished to the island of Patmos, uh, which is just off the west coast of Turkey, just a little away from Turkey, not a little, not too far from the sea port town of Ephesus. Uh, so he'd been sent away there, uh, basically thinking that, you know, uh, if we move this leader of the church away from the church, you know, things would just die out. Uh, but he, uh, and he was on the island of Patmos, and uh, uh, this was around, you know, AD 90, around AD 95, somewhere around that time. So we're coming close to the end of the first century. 
and John, the Lord Jesus gives John this amazing revelation of what is going to come, which then he was instructed to write, and John wrote everything down for us to read. Um, so we are talking about almost, um, you know, uh, uh, a difference of about five to six hundred years from Daniel to John, right? So Daniel was about 500 some years before Jesus, when that revelation was given to Daniel, he wrote it down. Here we come, John is almost 100 years into uh, uh, the other side of the cross, uh, coming to the end of the first century, and John is being given a revelation of the end time. So it is uh, it's it's a gap of about five to six hundred years, six hundred years almost, uh, between these two men, in in the revelation given to them. Now, uh, some things to keep in mind uh, as we go through the book of Revelation. Um, okay, let me just share the PDF so you can also see it uh, as I as I speak. Uh, Um, some things that um, we uh, need to keep in mind as we study the book of Revelation is there are things in the book of Revelation which can be taken literally and there are things that are figurative. That means there is a prophetic image being given, just like how we saw in the book of Daniel. So, for example, but just one example, the number seven. There are times when we have to take the number seven literally. For example, seven churches. Yeah, those were seven churches. So you take the number seven literally, seven churches. They were there. We have the names of the seven churches. We have their locations. So they were literally seven churches. Or as God reveals about the future, there, is, there are going to be three sets of uh, seven judgments, seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. No, so here the number seven is literal, actually seven. So seven seals, seven trumpets, seven uh, bowls. So in this case, seven is taken literal. But there, there are times in the book of Revelation where the number seven must be taken figuratively. Now, what is the meaning of the number seven? Meaning, in prophetic language, what does seven represent? And again, we're not getting into numerology. Uh, we, we shouldn't, you know, every time you see number seven doesn't mean, it, you know, you interpreted like this no but in biblical prophetic language seven rep means perfection or completeness the reason we see that is uh, when we see in the bible seven days in a week that makes one complete week perfect complete week god works on six days he rests on the seventh uh, there were seven primary feasts for the people in nature, we see uh, seven primary colors that gives completeness to everything there is about light and color, seven. So using that, we say seven represents perfection or completeness. So we, in certain cases, we have to interpret the number seven as prophetic imagery. So examples when there are seven spirits when the bible talks about seven spirits of god then so we we can't say there are seven holy spirits now some you know people have preached like that and they've made a mess of things because the bible says there's only one holy spirit one god one holy spirit there are not seven spirits so in this case where if taking that literally 
contradicts the rest of the Bible or leads into something that's absurd, then we shouldn't take it literally. We should then take it as figurative. So seven spirits cannot be taken literally because it contradicts scripture. There's only one Holy Spirit and it leads to some absurd theology, which has happened when people preach that. So we should avoid it and say, hey, yeah, seven is figurative, talking about the perfection, completeness of God, uh, or the seven attributes of the Spirit of God, which we see in Isaiah 11, verse 2. You know, he's a spirit of the Lord, wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Seven attributes. Similarly, when we see uh, talking about Jesus having seven eyes, oh, that's absurd, right? It's not like. But what is he talking about? It's representing omniscience. Eyes means knowledge, what you see, uh, omniscience, omnipresence, that he sees everywhere. You know, so we in that case, we say seven represents perfection, complete knowledge, complete presence. Right. So that's when we use seven as to mean to be figurative, not literal. Right? So that's one guiding uh, principle we're going to use as we go through the book of Revelation. And uh, we will see other things like uh, when we come to Revelation 12, it talks about the woman, it talks about 12 stars, it talks about the man child. How do we interpret that? Well, uh, given in the context, and we will look at it. You cross reference what the Bible said in the Old Testament about Joseph having a dream and uh, who is the man child, you know. So, through deduction and through comparison, we can arrive at what this all means. Because when it says the man child will rule the nations with a rod of iron, or oh, that language is only used for one person, it's Jesus, he is the one who's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. So the man child is Jesus. Then, who was the woman? Jesus came out of the nation of Israel. So the woman cannot represent the church because the church didn't give birth to Jesus. It was the Israel nation came Israel, the nation of Israel that Jesus came out of. The other thing is the sun, the moon, the eleven stars. Oh, where do we see that? Oh, we see it in the Old Testament. We see Joseph having a dream and his father and mother, sun and moon, uh, the 12 stars, including him, him and his brothers, oh, so clear. Therefore, Revelation 12 is talking about Israel as a nation and the, 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 the stars representing the, the 12 sons of Jacob. So the woman in Revelation 12 definitely represents Israel. The man-child represents Jesus. And so, you know, we, we use prophetic imagery plus simple deduction to arrive at the interpretation of what that image means, right? Some people say, oh, the woman represents the church. Then you say, look, 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 it doesn't match, it doesn't match. First, the prophetic image doesn't match. The prophetic image is used only of Israel. Second, the deduction, Jesus never came from the woman, from the church. He came from Israel. It's Jesus who raised up the church, not the church give birth to Jesus. So that deduction also makes it very clear that the woman represents Israel, man child represents Jesus, right? So I'm just giving you some idea here. We'll, we'll be looking at all of this in detail. So as we go through the book of Revelation, keep these things in mind. We interpret what we're reading in Revelation in the light of the rest of scripture. That's another guiding principle. So we have studied Daniel. What we will see when we come into Revelation is, as we progress in the book of Revelation, we, we begin to see some references to the book of Daniel, especially when you come to chapter 11, uh, chapter 12, chapter 13, references to the book of Daniel. Right? Chapter 11, we begin to read about the temple of God being desecrated. So hey. That sounds very similar to what we read in Daniel. Daniel mentioned that the temple of God will be desecrated. 
Are you seeing it here? Revelation 11, Revelation 12. The saints are being persecuted. Hey, we read that in Daniel, where this man is going to make war against the saints. Are we seeing it here? Revelation 13. We read about 10 kings, and from there, this Antichrist is coming. Let's look back to Daniel. We, we have studied that in Daniel. So there is that correlation that we can make between Revelation and Daniel. And therefore, we are able to interpret Daniel, uh, sorry, Revelation in the light of what we have seen in Daniel. Right? So interpreting scripture in the light of the rest of scripture. The other thing I want to, us to keep in mind is that there are some things we're going to read in the book of Revelation, which is open to interpretation. You say, why do you, what, what do you mean? That means, so, so keep, think, try to imagine this. Daniel is living around 550, 600 BC. God is showing him things that is going to happen more than 2,500 years into the future. Okay? Daniel has no context of those things. So, try to imagine this. If Daniel saw an aeroplane, what would he write down? He will not use language like, oh, there is a big aeroplane flying. No. To Daniel, who is living around 600 BC, if God is showing him things, some you know, about 2,500 years into the future, he's seeing an aeroplane. The closest, the context he has is hey, that looks like a big bird. Okay? It's making a lot of noise, and he will write something like that. You know, I see a very big bird, big nose, big. Uh, it's got two wings on the side. It's got a tail pointing into heaven. And there are other two other wings coming from the tail that's going into heaven. Something like that, he'll write. Uh, to the best that he can, he's going to describe that in the language he has. He has no. He will. He, he will not use the word aeroplane. You know, he will, he won't have any of those that thing. If God shows Daniel, you know, a big lot of destruction happening because of nuclear bombs and missiles happening, what will he write? He will, say, he will say, I'm seeing things flying in the sky. Like, you know, if he sees hundreds of missiles flying, what will he write about? You know, he will not use the word missiles. He has no idea. But he'll say, I see lots of things flying. There is smoke coming out from their tail. They have a pointed head or something, you would say. And they're going very fast. They're moving very swiftly. And wherever they land, it's a, a there is a, dust and smoke and it's sulfur and, and and he will use colors that he can you know language he talks about the color that's all he will write so we have to keep that in mind that god is showing daniel things are going to happen way in the future but daniel has no context for it he can only put it in the language that he has and those kinds of things when we read it's open to interpretation because we don't know what that God actually showed Daniel, right? We don't know what God actually showed. We don't know what Daniel actually saw. He only captured it to the best he could in the words and the language he had and in the context he had. And so we will be reading about some of those things uh, as we journey through Revelation. And those kinds of things are open to interpretation, meaning because we don't know exactly what God showed Daniel, what he saw. So we don't fight about it. What we do is we say, okay, this is what he saw, this is what he wrote, and uh, it could be, because we're just saying it could be, because we don't 100% sure show what God actually showed him, Daniel. So we say it could, you know, in our understanding, Maybe these were drones flying in the sky. Maybe these were intercontinental ballistic missiles that were flying in the sky. Or maybe these were nuclear weapons that are causing this kind of 
what, what Daniel is saying. Or then Daniel says, I see a mountain that is smoking. Well, maybe it was a volcano erupting. Right? Now, Daniel doesn't have the language of writing volcanoes. He will just say, I saw a mountain that is full of smoke coming out. But maybe, maybe God was showing him eruptions of volcanoes during our time. But Daniel didn't have language for volcanoes. So he said, I saw, I saw mountains that was, you know, smoking up, uh, coming out. Smoke was coming out of those mountains. That's what he will say. So we, so that subject to interpretation, it's open to interpretation. So we may, we will say, well, it's probably this, right? Uh, and uh, keep that in mind. We don't have to fight about it. We'll just say it's probably that, and you know, and and, and leave it at that. You're not going to argue on those things, right? And the last point that uh, I want to say is that. Our approach to studying the book of Daniel is the way God told Daniel how he was giving it. You know, in Revelation 1.19, we'll start reading Revelation 1, but in Revelation 1.19, God tells Daniel, write the things which you have seen, things which are, and things which will take place. Sorry, John, John thank you. John, so God is telling John, John, so what was I saying? I'm saying Daniel, Daniel, Daniel. Sorry, it's John. I have changed my thinking now to John. So John wrote whatever he saw in the language that he had. OK, so please correct the last five minutes where I was talking about Daniel. Please correct that. I was. I, it, it should be John. Anyway, uh, yeah. So John, when he was writing the book of Revelation, which was around AD 90, God was showing him things about 2,000 years into the future. Sorry, I need to correct myself. Uh, God was showing John things 2,000 years into the future. So John could only write it in the context that he had. Right? He had no idea about missiles and drones and nuclear weapons and those kinds of things, which we are aware of today. So going to this next point, God, the Lord Jesus tells John, write the things which you have seen the things which are things which will take place. So there are the book of Revelation is broken and is separated into these three things. Things which you have seen. Revelation 1, John sees a vision of the Lord Jesus and how he's looking at the churches, things which you've seen. Things which are Revelation chapters 1 and 2, the seven churches existing at that time. Things which will take place. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, all the way on is things which will take place into the future. So when we read chapter 4, verse 1 on, keep in mind, everything from chapter 4, verse 1 is things which will take place. That means it's in the future. It's not. It was not John, the present in John's time. It wasn't things that the Lord, uh, that had already happened. No, it's in the future. So. It's something yet to be fulfilled. And when we read that, we will take it as God gave to John things sequentially, in the, in the, in the sequence that they're going to unfold. But while doing that, there are times when there's a flashback example. Revelation 12 talks about when the dragon was cast out of heaven and he took a third of the stars with him. So it's a flashback. At some point in the past, this old serpent, Satan, was cast out of heaven and he took a third of the, of the angels with him. So that's, that already happened, although it's being mentioned in Revelation 12. Flashback. Then there are some things which are parenthetical in nature. That means the Lord Jesus is revealing a sequence of events to John. Then there's a pause and saying, okay, John, he's talking to John specifically. So that's a pause, a parenthetical. John, I'm talking to you. So Revelation, I think it's uh, um, 
Revelation. Uh, um, what's that? Revelation ten. There's a pause. God tells John, John, okay, eat this book. So it's a pause and say, John, you eat this book. John eats the book. It's sweet in his mouth. It's very bitter in his stomach. And the angel says, okay, John, you have to prophesy a lot more, meaning there's more that I'm going to show you. So chapter 10, Revelation 10 is parenthetical. It's a pause. It's just the Lord dealing with John. And then there are some things which are stated in sequence, but it's extended till the end. Meaning, Revelation 11, we read about two witnesses, prophets. And in one passage, three and a half years of their ministry is described, start to finish. So you don't find them repeated later on. You just only in Revelation 11, said so there will be two witnesses, they will be on the earth, and they'll be doing this, and they'll do it for three and a half years. That means from that till the end, that is all described in one passage. So it's a fast forward in one passage. So while we say that everything is given to us sequentially, just keep in mind that while those things are being said sequentially, there are places where there is a flashback, there is a pause, or there's a fast forward in that passage itself and we will point that out but otherwise the rest of it it is going to take it all sequentially it's given to us as it unfolds okay so um with that in mind uh you know we will uh, get into it this chart which you have seen you know in your second year uh kind of you know puts the puts the chapter the revelation uh, Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3, uh, it's here in the church age. The rapture takes place, Revelation chapter 4, all the way till the end, Revelation 20, or end of Revelation 19, Revelation 20 gives us about the millennium and brings us till the end of the millennium, which is the great white throne judgment, and then Revelation 21 and 22, new heavens and the new earth. So, Book of Revelation, kind of, you can, you know, map it out like that in relation to the sequence of events that we uh, know about the end times. Okay. Um, yeah, so I said all that. Okay, so any questions before we start reading Revelation chapter one? Any questions so far? In just the introduction. Yes, David, please go ahead. Thank you, Pastor. I just uh, wanted to know uh, when you said Revelation is mostly sequential. Uh, so, is it is it right to say it is? Um, uh, you know, uh, can you can you explain more on that? And is it right to say it's in a chronological order? Yes. So uh, yeah. So we can say it's given to us chronologically. That means as events would play out in time so if you're looking at a timeline that means it's happening chronologically one after the other or in a sequence one after the other uh, as it would happen in that seven year period so literally uh, revelation 4 1 till end of revelation 19 is literally seven years and uh, we will see revelation 11 1 is the end of the first three and a half years and the start of the second three and a half years. So uh, it's a sequence or chronological record of a uh, statement of events in that seven year period. And then Revelation, end of Revelation 19 is the Battle of Armageddon. Revelation 20 on to the end of 20, chapter 20 is basically 1000 years what will happen in that millennium. 21 and 22 is new heavens and the new earth. So it's given to us chronologically with the understanding that at some points there will be a little flashback or there will be a little pause or there will be 
a little fast forward. But otherwise, and we will point out those particular instances, but otherwise, it's all given to us sequentially. This is how it's going to happen chronologically, one after the other, it's going to happen in time. Your basket, thank you. Okay. Yes, Tefina, your question? Yeah, so when we say it's parenthetical in nature, do we mean like those things we don't have to take it into context because God is just talking to John? Uh, is that what we mean? Like we can neglect it? So, yeah. yeah, so. When you say parenthetical or a pause, it means that is not part of what is going to happen. It was just God talking to John, saying, hello, John, and he's having a conversation with John, right? So that happens in between. While all this is happening, uh, uh, oh, sorry. while all this is happening, uh, in, while God is revealing things that were going to come, in the middle, he says, John, uh, I'm just having a word with you, right? That's chapter 10. So chapter 10 is not about what is going to happen or what anything has nothing to do with the end times in that sense. It's more of what God is dealing with John, saying, John, the angel says, John, I want you to eat this book because there's more things to prophesy. Uh, similarly, you see in chapter 14, a little bit, God is having a conversation with John. Uh, it says, John, there are going to be four angels. And then, of course, he talks about the four angels, which will happen at that time, Revelation 14. Yeah. OK, fine. So let's get started. Let's start reading uh, uh, verse by verse. Uh, we'll read Revelation. Um, chapter one, and uh, then we will um, take things uh, forward from here. So uh, let's see. Revelation. Let's just read the um, the first three verses. Revelation chapter one, verses one, two, and three. Somebody can read that. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave, to, gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent angels and signified it uh, by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the word of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Okay. So this is the introduction to this book, the entire book of Revelation. And uh, John is saying this was given by the Lord Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it was given by the Lord, and it's an unveiling that the Lord Jesus gave John about things which must shortly take place. Uh, very interesting. Shortly. But now it's only 2,000 years. So keep in mind, this shortly has to do with his reference of time, not our reference. For our reference, 2,000 years old, that's a long time. But for the Lord, we know a 1,000 years is like a day. So it's shortly from his perspective, because he's the one giving it to John. Right? So the revelation of Jesus, which the Lord gave, of things which must shortly take place. He sent and signified by his angel to his servant, John. Now that word angel, just to keep this in mind, that the Greek word angelos, that angel 
it's the same word. It, it simply means messenger. Somebody's carrying a message. But that word angelos is used sometimes to refer to angelic beings when they bring messages from God and so on. It's also used to talk about human beings as messengers of God. So depending on the context, we have to determine that angel is referring to an angelic being or angel is referring to a human being. So in some places, um, the Bible translators uh, themselves will, will mention they will use the word messengers of the church. That means they are they recognize, you know, this obviously is referring to messengers, human messengers, human beings. Uh, in some places where they leave it as angel, yeah, referring to an angelic being. But what we must keep in mind that when we hear, uh, John is saying, he signified by his angel to his servant John. So this angel is a messenger. Uh, we see that there are times in the book of Revelation, the messenger is an angelic being or the messenger is an elder. An elder speaks to John. So you understand that there are times an elder is speaking to John. There are times God himself is speaking directly to John. And there are times an angel is talking to John. Okay. And the same word angel we will see in Revelation, end of Revelation chapter 1 and in chapters 2 and 3, the Lord is saying, unto the angel of this church speak. Tell the angel of this church. Now, based on what, what the Lord is speaking to this angel and what this angel is responsible for, we can conclude that the angel is not an angelic being, but it is a human being. Because an angel is not responsible for what is being taught and preached and what is happening in a community of believers. It is the messenger, the person whom God has placed in leadership in that community who's responsible for what's happening. So based on that, we say that in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, when the Lord Jesus is giving a message to each church and saying to the angel of the church in Ephesus, to the angel of the church at Smyrna, to the angel of the church at Philadelphia, to the angel of the church in such and such a place, you say this, we, that word mess, messenger refers to the human being who's in leadership of that local church community, or we would say pastor or leader, because you, you know, just based on the context, it has to be a human person who is leading the church and is being held responsible for what's going on in that church. And it's the human person and the community that, you know, in, 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 uh, in uh, five out of the seven churches, he says, you have to repent. The angels don't, doesn't have to repent. It's the leader and the community who need to repent uh, and correct their uh, whatever the Lord is pointing out, right? So keep in mind, the word angel simply means messenger, angelos. And depending on the context, we have to understand it, who is speaking, whether it's an actual angelic being or an elder who is speaking or who is being spoken to, that it's uh, the elder or the leader of the church in that place who is being addressed, okay? And... So he, he, it was true, he's bearing witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all that he saw. The phrase, the testimony of Jesus Christ, is an interesting phrase. Um, what is it really referring to? It is referring to what the Lord Jesus is saying. The testimony of Jesus Christ. It is also referring to the testimony we give to the Lord Jesus Christ. That phrase, the testimony of Jesus, is used uh, in the book of Revelation. Example, if you go with me to um, Revelation 12 and verse 17. So we just cross-referencing that phrase, the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 12, 17, it says, the dragon was enraged with a woman. He went to make war with the rest of her offspring 
who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So it's talking about the people who are believing in the Lord or holding on to the word of God, and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 19, 11, Revelation 19, and uh, verse 11, it says here, sorry, not verse, um, verse 10, Revelation, did I say? Yeah, Revelation 19, 10. It says, and I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So once again, the phrase, actually two times, testimony of Jesus. What we read in chapter 1, verse 2, we are reading it here again, Revelation 19, 10, two times. So this elder is telling John, I am your fellow servant and of your brethren. So uh, he could be one of the other apostles who's been killed. Because he's saying, I'm your fellow servant. That means I was working with you. I'm your fellow servant. right? And of your brethren. Who have the testimony of Jesus. Let me say, I also was somebody giving testimony to Jesus, speaking of the Lord. But he gives us something more. He says, telling, he's telling John, John, you worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That means us giving testimony is actually an inspired is inspired by the spirit of God, by the spirit of prophecy. So the Holy Spirit is a spirit of prophecy. When we give testimony to Jesus, we are inspired by the spirit of prophecy, by the Holy Spirit. So very the testimony of Jesus, it is what the Lord Jesus is speaking. It is what we are speaking by the spirit of God about Jesus. So the phrase, testimony of Jesus, used both ways. And Revelation 1, 2, what the Lord, it is referring to what the Lord Jesus is saying. In Revelation 12, 19, uh, sorry, 12, 17, and Revelation 19, 10, it's what the believers are saying about the Lord, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Okay? So very interesting phrase the testimony of jesus going back to revelation 1 verse 3 this is one book revelation 1 3 where there is a blessing pronounced on those who read the words and keep it now we know this is true about all of scripture right we are all blessed when we read all of scripture and keep it that's a blessing but in this book specifically the way the book begins verse 3 if you read the words of this book and you keep it, you will be blessed. So it's, a, it's like an incentive, it's a motivation to read the book of Revelation. Now, sometimes people say, oh, I don't read the book of Revelation. I'll read the whole New Testament except Revelation because I can't understand it. It's so difficult. It's all some things that I don't understand. Well, verse 3 saying at the opening of this book, hey, blessed is he who reads this prophecy, who hears these words, and it keeps these things in it. I mean, read it, hear these words, follow it, you'll be blessed. Of course, we know that's true of all of Scripture, but here's very em emphasis given. So don't neglect the book of Revelation. Don't avoid it just because it's difficult. Actually, when you read through it, you'll find it's not very difficult. It's very beautiful. It's very clear, very simple in terms of this is what's going to happen. And uh, we will see that there's that blessing in reading it, hearing it, and following its instruction. Okay. And once again, the time element is there. It says the time is near. And remember, it's the Lord saying it. So for him, hey, 
This is going to happen very soon. Time is near. Okay. Now, let's read the next eight um, verses, four to eight. So now the Lord is revealing himself to John, and he's addressing the churches that are there at that time. Revelation 1, 4 through 8, please. Somebody can read it. John. <clears throat> greeting, greeting the seven churches. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who, who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Amen. Amen. So this is a very powerful introduction of who the Lord Jesus is. But I want us to notice verses 4 and 5 carefully. Because in verse 4 and 5, we see the Godhead, the triune God. Look at it very carefully. Um, he's saying, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. That means these are seven churches which actually existed at that time. right? So sometimes you might hear preachers say, or they use the seven churches that are that we're going to read about in chapter two as seven church ages. But I feel that's incorrect. Why? Because he's actually referring to seven churches which were there at that time in Asia. He's not referring to seven church ages. He's not referring to seven church periods. No, no, no. These were seven churches that existed at that time. So we should leave it like that. Now, we can read from, we can read about these seven churches and learn a lot, which we are going to do. Each of these seven churches has a lot of message for us. We can learn a lot, definitely, from all of the seven churches. We can learn. But to interpret each church as a church age is not correct because right here he says, verse 4, these are seven churches who were there at that time in Asia. Look at the Godhead revealed in verse 4 and 5. So he's saying, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was and who is to come. So that's from him who is, who was, who is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Are there seven spirits? No. One Holy Spirit. So here, the word seven must not be taken literally. No. There is one Holy Spirit. Seven spirits talking about the seven attributes or the completeness or the perfection of the Holy Spirit who is before the throne. That means he is in the part of the Godhead, in the throne room. The seven attributes we know, Isaiah 11, 2. Spirit of the Lord, spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, fear of the Lord. Seven attributes. But seven spirits, not meaning seven different spirits, but one perfect, complete Holy Spirit before the throne. And, verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. That's the eternal word. So in verse 4 and 5, in the throne room, we are seeing the Godhead, God the Father, the one who is, who was, and who is to come. That's his introduction. God the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits before the throne. He is the spirit who is perfect and complete. 
and the eternal word, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth. Okay, so let's pause here. We'll go for a break, come back and continue this. I need to change the headset, the battery is gone, so I'll change that and uh, we'll come back, continue this after the break.